Peter. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity to give you an update. So on the brief, uh, the possibility that somebody here who's not sure what white space is will put a slide up to explain how white or what white space is. And then we'll delve into the details of um, the guts of this presentation. So this first slide is a, a, a screenshot from one of our web tools um, of a single 6 megahertz TV channel. Um, the center of the interest is Idaho, Nevada, as you can see. And the pink, yellow, and greenish spots on that, that map identify protected service contours for a variety of broadcast interests. Um, so those are the active users of that single 6 megahertz channel. And everything else, which actually looks white, is literally that. It's white space. And so that spectrum has the potential to be used on a secondary basis um, by URI as unlicensed spectrum. And so white space is literally the gaps between those broadcast entities. Um, the key to white space and an unlicensed mode, unlike what you might have been used to in terms of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, is that in order to keep track of these protected entities, which do change from time to time, the white space radios, at least currently under the rules, have to query a database periodically and based on their location and device type, find out what white space is available to them at any given time and place, um, most of which should be transparent to an end user. So we're going to talk a little bit later about how the mechanics of deploying a network happens with this new concept. Um, if you roll up the available white space, then obviously there's, there's more than a single channel. Uh, and this map um, looks a little odd on the display, but it is a subset of white space. And we picked this deliberately because it's really germane to a lot of the applications and services we're going to talk about today. But this is white space in the UHF band for what are called fixed devices, which are high power devices. And as you'll notice, there are some black spots on that map, and they pretty much sort of correlate to the centers of the top 10 NFL cities, which says that there's actually no UHF white space for fixed devices in those locations. But that doesn't mean that there may not be VHF white space, um, or even if you go to the lower power devices, which have more liberal um, rules, that there would be a spectrum you could use for those low power devices. But for the UHF devices, um, that's the available channel map as of today. And remember that this is talking about channels. So each of those is 6 megahertz. Um, so what you see is that over you know, probably 70% of the country, there's well over 100 megahertz worth of spectrum. And over probably 85 to 90% of the country, well over 60 megahertz of spectrum just in the UHF band that can be used for these white space solutions. And again, this is for the more restricted high power solution. So take this just as a subset of what's available. Right. So this next slide, as we get past the brief introduction to what white space is, may be a, a little disappointing. And if you look and realize how long we've actually been talking about white space, uh, in fact, the first sort of thoughts and concepts are almost 10 years old now. Um, but what's important is if you look at the top of this line is the sort of first notice of proposed, rule, proposed rulemaking came out in 2004. And it took four years to get the first set of rules out of the FCC. But it only took two more years to get the revised and updated set of rules, which are the rules we work under now, and less than a year to get the first radios and databases into certification for use. Um, so the message from this is that although it's been slow and long, the process, it's accelerating and it's gathering speed. And as you start to look forward into next year, things start to get much more interesting and that the opportunities for white space are now real. Um, so don't dwell too much on the fact it took us a long time to get here. Um, the, the, the issue today is that now is the point where we're almost real. So um, as I said, you're actually seeing the first solutions go through a process of certification, and those will become commercially available um, you know, as early as the first of the year. And in the first half of next year, you can pretty much probably predict that there will be 
several databases that will be available, and certainly at least a handful, if not more, um, radio solutions is the first wave of, of capability. And so as we go forward, uh, on what we're going to focus on is what, what those solutions are going to be next year and what you can do with them. So lastly on sort of white space in general, what's new, uh, as I just said, we, we Spectrum Bridge went through a database trial um, a, a, a few weeks ago and it went through its comment and reply and that was really the last step of the database which is the new component in this solution and is a necessary component for the radios to operate. Um, and as recently as yesterday, um, Telcordia started a trial of their database solution. Um, so while Spectrum Bridge is pretty much done, the Telcordia folks are only a couple of months behind. Um, and so we anticipate that we'll finally get through that gate uh, between now and the end of the year, and we'll be very hopeful that we can go live with first solutions in the beginning of next year, because we will be then dovetailing into radios that you'll hear more about from, from our partners that are going through certification in parallel. Um, they've pretty much done a lot of their sort of typical radio part 15 testing. Now they're being integrated in to be sort of verified with the database so that the solution, which is a white space solution, can go out the door. And for now today, we're going to focus on the set of rules that exist, which is the rules that were put in place at the end of last year. Um, but it's interesting to note that there are a number of updates under consideration um, from the FCC. Um, some of these have come about because of requests for changes during the process, and some of them are coming about because, uh, as I'll go on to in a minute, there are other regulators contemplating white space. And as naturally is the case, people are starting to normalize and come to sort of standardize consistent rules of, of how they work. And these rules uh, affect a number of areas of operation. Some of the requests and thoughts center around um, and the, the height an antenna can be above the ground or above the average. And um, in some cases, if allowed to go higher would make um, more coverage capability. Um, there's some requests to change access to registration data. Um, in honesty, there are some people who think there should be more available data, and some people think it should be less. Um, there are some requests to make some modifications to the emission map and even to the way that these fixed devices work. And, and again, some of that would impact the previous chart of the U.S. where we showed some black areas where, in fact, they may not be um, black anymore, i.e. no channel. So generally speaking, there's, there's a possibility that there will be some rules changes. Um, obviously, from the incumbent broadcaster point of view, they're going to be very concerned that whatever changes happen, maintain their protection adequately. And so they're very concerned that these do not um, make their situation worse. But if these rules can be adopted in, in a manner that doesn't um, uh, make the situation worse for a broadcaster, what it will mean is there will be actually more opportunity for innovation and potentially more market opportunities for white space. So in general, what we have today, while it's good and interesting, may get better in the future. And the other thing that's sort of exciting about this whole process is that while the U.S. has clearly been in the lead and the forefront of this idea for the best part of 10 years, um, it hasn't gone unnoticed by the rest of the world. And in fact, there are many places now where white space is becoming uh, very actively considered and regulation is coming into place. And just on a personal note, one of the things that surprised us with our trial of a U.S. solution was how much interest there was in that trial from other countries around the world. So you've got entities like Ofcom in the UK who are going through various processes, and we'll come back to those in a minute. The key to it is that their rules and their regulations are similar to what we have in the US, both in terms of the spectrum that they're considering as well as the rules. Um, and at least as, as a stepping stone or a first step, they're all going to have a similar kind of database access um, to, to manage the white space. Um, the Canadians, uh, obviously, as close neighbors, are looking very closely at our rules and will likely adopt something very similar. Um, and in fact, they went through a process earlier in August, and they're going through a reply comment period, so we'd expect them to be very active next year. And, and also, in terms of, you know, sort of momentum, 
standards organizations have really been focused in, in the background in many cases on the standardization of technologies and capabilities that make white space workable. And in the IEEE, it's a combination of uh, 802.11, which is the Wi-Fi group looking to make Wi-Fi um, something that would work in white space. Um, there's a group called 802.22, which has been looking at rural broadband specifically, and another group called 802.19 which is looking at how radios coexist with each other. Um, so a lot of work that's been going on for the best part of two years. So it's not like they're starting, they're actually wrapping up. And last but not least, the Internet Engineering Task Force is focused on a, an entity they call PAUSE, which stands for Protocol for Accessing White Space. And that is a, an interface standard that's trying to um, harmonize the ways that radios talk to databases so that as white space becomes real, um, around the world that it can be deployed somewhat consistently. So moving on, um, and again, now why and what is the interest of TV white space? So the rules allow for unlicensed operation, similar to the rules that are in place for technology you might use like Wi-Fi. Um, and, and so it's a non-exclusive use. So it will be shared access, and the radios, just like Wi-Fi, will have to learn to live together. But what, what white space does, and, and I should categorize this by saying first, it's not a panacea. Um, despite some rumors, it won't solve world hunger or the national debt. But if you think about it as another tool in the tool chest, it really brings two things that are of interest. The first is that, again, harking back to that earlier um, slide, 60 to 120 megahertz worth of prime spectrum is really good. And the, the rules allow for similar modulations and performance to what we are used to with Wi-Fi, so bits per hertz is, is going to be similar. So it's going to give you an overlay of additional capacity on top of spectrums available today. And the other thing that's interesting is because it's relatively low frequency in the VHF and UHF bands, it's going to give you better propagation than the microwave solutions we run today at 2.4 gigahertz. So the little chart at the bottom shows a Wi-Fi radio running under 2.4 ISM band rule, and the same radio on the right running in a UHF um, TV channel. And, and it's pretty easy to see that you get about a 3x improvement in the coverage. So that means that in this example, which was a sort of a rural solution, you'd get away with about a third of the equipment in terms of providing coverage. So additional coverage and capacity and applied in a Wi-Fi environment, you know, a 3x to 5x improvement over what you can do today. And if you were to choose other technologies, and I, again, don't want to focus just on Wi-Fi, um, there are folks who are looking at LTE-based solutions. There are folks looking at very customized solutions for vertical applications, and even folks looking at sort of leveraging WiMAX-type capabilities. So um, those, those will all come to pass in good time. And lastly, on this whole sort of white space thing, and again, not, not to beat it to death, but the, the, the rest of the world is really now starting to play catch up. Um, the fact that regulators around the world are now getting involved in trials and creating regulation, um, the fact that those regulators and multinational corporations are involved in, in trials and, and capabilities today, and we're already aware of, of a big upswing in that um, activity next year. Um, and uh, as we talk about some of the trials that we've been involved in, um, they've been involved with you know big in influential industry players like Microsoft and Google and Dell. Uh, and as you go around the world, you can sort of pick the who's who of Fortune 500 companies, uh, most of whom are, are playing with, in some way, shape, or form, white space in terms of trials or efforts around the standardization process. So white space is not a flash in the pan in the U.S. It's really going to be a global initiative. And, and again, to reinforce what I said earlier, there, there are subtle differences. Um, in, the, in Europe, they use 8 megahertz channels rather than 6. Um, but the UHF band uh, in particular is, particularly between sort of 450 megahertz and 700, is pretty much consistent around the world and, and will be available. Um, the VHF band we use here is less global, but you know, again, no, no reason not to use it. But just like with Wi-Fi that became a, a worldwide standard and, and the fact that you and I probably don't notice the difference 
uh, when it's operating in different locales. Um, white space rules will end up enabling similar kinds of technologies. So with that said, I think we'll move on to sort of specific market opportunities for you know, TV white space. And again, we're talking very much today in terms of the short-term capability. So in practice, we're talking about first-generation equipment and without any disparagement to the, the radio folks here, those early radios are going to be moderately expensive when you compare them to the volume Wi-Fi fourth generation chipsets that we're all used to. So in, in the early stages of next year, the applications that will be predominantly deployed will be the fixed high power solutions where there's high value in terms of um, the application or it's a situation where white space can be used where either because of capacity or coverage reasons, other technologies based on other frequencies are not um, viable today. So that's really what's going to happen in the coming 12 months. But we're already hearing from some of the radio partners that they're beginning to reduce their technology down towards chipsets. And it's very possible that chipsets will start to appear towards the end of next year. And that certainly in the years after that, these white space solutions will become more mainstream. They'll become much you know, smaller, cheaper. Um, and so the, the types of applications will grow and, and, and expand beyond that. But again, for today we're going to focus on the sort of the, the top left side of, of what we can really do in you know this next 12 months. So one of the applications is rural broadband. Um, again, harking back to the map, um, rural broadband. Uh, is, you know, the picture on the right, a hilly, treed environment, low frequency UHF spectrum works great in that environment. And in areas where you probably take a picture like that, there's probably a hundred or more megahertz worth of white space. Um, so the opportunity to really put broadband into these locations, and although the equipment is more expensive than Wi-Fi initially, if you can get a three to five x reduction in the number of base stations, then obviously you you know you can start to look at that in a different light. Uh, another application that's um, out there is. Uh, where we see a lot of opportunity initially, and, and certainly, I and mean, this is a sort of a very busy slide, talks about M to M in general, but in practice, really what we're talking about is, again, those high value solutions. So um, it might be related to agriculture, it might be related to monitoring in terms of sort of EPA monitoring, um, but environments where there's a value to be had from what those things you're connecting can bring. Um, so initially, at least this next year, it's not likely to be sort of tying together all the electric meters around the country, but tying together EPA sensors or weather control or such like, um, pipeline monitoring, those become the kind of applications where the value is you know, uh, recognizable right now. So how do you go about deploying white space radios? So um, the first step Is, is you've got to deploy a base station. And once you've deployed a base station, that base station has to be connected to the internet and so that you can go and query a database. And then what will happen is that as long as the, the database is, is capable of, of, of working with the spectrum in the location, you can go through the process of, of registering that database and going forward with its capability. So that base station, once it's got access from the, um, uh, the database, will be able to transmit on one of a set of channels that it's been given. And then you've got to go and declare, put an endpoint out. And the endpoint, um, because we're talking about these fixed devices, by the rules, also has to query the database. But obviously, it doesn't have a direct connection, so it has to connect by scanning and, and latching onto a base station. And the rules allow it to piggyback that base station insofar as it goes and queries the database for a set of channels. And the database will take that device through the same set of um, you know, sort of procedures and assuming that it produces its valid is that it will return with a set of channels to that endpoint. And then one of two things will happen. Either the base station and the client got the same list of channels, in which case they're good to operate, or they may have got slightly different channels and they might have to go through some 
negotiation before they can um, communicate, but they will then have got a lease or a permission to use a set of channels for a, a period of time. Now, the rules allow for them to have that lease for up to 24 hours, and there are various uh, arguments as about whether you should go for the maximum or something less than that, and, and with lack of time today, we'll, we'll come back to that in, in some other time. Um, but the point is that they will have to go back periodically and query the database to make sure they can either use the same channel or a, a different channel. And, and the final piece of this is really that most of this is going to go on transparently. So this is something that's being worked out between the radio vendor and the database provider and is then being tested by the FCC. So to all intents and purposes, as, as a minimum, you just have to plug these things in and walk through the steps and you wouldn't have to get involved in the process. But if you look at the next level of how you would deploy these things, then let's look at it from a sort of a bigger level. You know, I want to provide a service or a solution. The first step, obviously, is you're going to have to figure out if there's white space in the location for the kind of application you want to run. Now, we have one, and I, I apologize for the self-promotion, but if you go to show my white space, you can put a location in, and you can add, tell it what kind of device you've got, and it'll tell you what channels are available. And uh, although I haven't checked it explicitly, I suspect that Telcordia will do something similar, and I'm sure other tools will become available. So you'll be able to identify the kind of white space that's available and the amount of white space in your location. And then you've obviously got to go and pick uh, at radios that, that match your application and service needs. And configure your base station first and connect it to the internet. And once it's up and operational and communicating, you can obviously start to deploy the client devices. And as I said before, most of that could be automatic. But then you get to the next step, which is how do I manage the network? And, and that really becomes a function that is um, more likely to be collaborative with the radio vendor and or the database provider um, on, on two levels. One is because white space is this changing uh, environment. And secondarily, because you can also leverage the fact that you've now got radios that are going to communicate regularly with a database, and you can start to consider what you might go and do. So the first thing that you would probably be interested in is what I call them a preferred channel list. So the, the FCC rules require that um, the database give a set of unoccupied channels to a radio, and that it does so in a consistent manner to all radios in all locations, independent of what they're trying to do or what they are. But the reality is that not all channels will be created equal. Some of them will be more applicable based on either the application or the location or the type of radio. And so it's conceivable that you might want to actually um, put in some mechanism that allow you to prefer certain channels over others. Uh, and again, there's a lot of, uh, we could spend a whole webinar on why you'd want to do that and how, but. Um, we, we don't have time today, unfortunately, so we, we'll keep going. Um, one of the things you've obviously got to do is you have to maintain your internet connection because if, without the internet connection, when the lease expires, the radios will stop working. Um, so no internet means no white space. So the, the ability to have a direct broadband connection to a base station or an indirect broadband connection to a remote station is clearly a critical component of what you're doing. Um, Again, now we've got the fact that all these devices are going to go and register and get channel lists based on the location. Um, directly and indirectly, you'll have some awareness now of, of neighbors. And you could then start to, rather than just be totally ignorant of the people across the street or, or across the county, you have the ability to at least be aware of them and potentially start to work on coexistence and interference mitigation policies, either through the radio or through the database or in a combination of two. And given that you have that connection, um, the ability to tie in what the database does with the operations and management of the radio or tie it into the operations and management software of a service provider or even an application um, to assist with those capabilities that I talked about before are all things that you can consider and, and from quite frankly, in some cases, you'd probably want to be somewhat cognizant of, um, if only because not only is white space new, but the fact that it isn't uh, as, as sort of 
deterministic in the sense that from time to time the channel availability might change and you ought to be aware of what that means in, in the context to you. So in terms of partner development, um, what we what Spectrum Bridge does is we, we sort of run the database and we sort of sit in the middle of a, a relationship really that normally would have existed between a radio vendor and a service provider. Um, and we have to do that because of the rules and, and because, quite frankly, our primary objective in life is to protect incumbents against secondary users. And so anything that we do above and beyond that is totally permitted by the rules as long as we remember that our first goal in life is to make sure that a secondary user, a white space user, does not interfere based on the rules with the, um, the incumbent operations, which was what we showed on that first map. And so what happens is that we, um, we then can sit in between and, and provide uh, the ability to pull these folks together. And in this next slide, it'll sort of give you a quick summary of some of the things that that means. And again, these were just by way of example. So obviously with the radios, um, we now have something new in that they have to work with the database. So we have to work with them to help them with um, the integration of their radio to make sure it behaves according to the rules. And then subsequently to their deployment, um, we, Spectrum Bridge, have to be um, basically make a commitment that we will support those radios if one of you were to buy them for their useful life. So we have to provide that registration and channel allocation capability on behalf of those radios in order for them to operate in white space. For the service providers, the, the real two things that, that come in there is that the um, some of these tools that we can provide in terms of planning, so the simplest case being, you know, is there any white space where I am and what can I do with it? And are there any specifics in the rules that, that might affect my decision on whether to use white space or not? Um, all the way through to the fact that when you've got these frequency agile radios that are already talking to a database, um, we actually have the capability to provide access to other spectrum, um, which we call secondary market spectrum. Now that may not be free, um, but on the other hand, it may be exclusive use if you're willing to pay for it. So the service providers really, we, we get in the business of trying to help them manage the the spectrum, which is really the resource, the raw resource, which is the bandwidth that they want to provide either to customers or that drive their application. And last but not least, there's a sort of another group who are the folks that typically are in the business of designing and deploying networks on behalf of others. And there's this new capability now, or, or <laughs> capability or complexity, whichever way you look at it, that is really related to what does the database do and how does that work, work in here? And so what, what happens there is that the not only do those folks use the combination of what's in the database and the radio, but if they were to work with a radio partner on, on a vertical application or a specific service um, with the right hooks, they can actually integrate into the database and leverage the information that the database is required to collect. And because we are required to collect it specifically about individual radios, but also there's a macro level, almost like a crowdsourced view of radios and where they are and what they're doing, it allows these value-added resellers to, to leverage some of that information, privacy concerns notwithstanding, to help them with how they design and deploy and manage the, the, the utility of these networks. So with that said, after probably 30 minutes, I'm going to sit down and I think we're going to show and turn over to our radio partners for a few minutes to tell you a bit about what they do and, and, and how they do it. Thank right. you, Peter. Um, we're going to change the um, <coughs> agenda a little bit and now we're going to switch over to our radio partners. Um, Andy Mancone and Larry Cruz from KTS Wireless, um, they'll talk a little bit about their products. And uh, KTS Wireless has been uh, a leading provider of wireless technology for over 28 years and is uh, now offering uh, data radio products um, for nearly all applications in the UHF and VHF uh, band. Uh, Andy, go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for your time and uh, good morning to our friends on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Andy Mancone. I'm with uh, KTS Wireless. I'm also joined by our VP of Engineering, Larry Cruz, who's going to keep me honest on uh, the facts. And uh, 
You know, we um, have been very privileged to uh, work with Spectrum Bridge from the beginning. We've done a lot of testing. We have a lot of empirical data uh, to go on. And, um, you know, as a company, we have uh, fielded, designed, and manufactured uh, what we call agility uh, data radios uh, for three years now. Our white space radio, the AWR, is uh, named Agility White Space Radio. And the, uh, we're kind of in the generation 1A right now. We, uh, the, the product is available with two uh, modulation schemes, FSK and SOQPSK, for uh, 2.0 and uh, 3.1 megabits, uh, respectively. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about our experience out in the market and why that kind of shaped what our modulation schemes were right out of the gate. Uh, remember, in our software-defined radios, the field, uh, the waveforms are field upgradable, and uh, there will be uh, field upgrades in 2012 for other modulation schemes. As you can see uh, in the slide, there's a depiction of uh, a couple of depictions of the radio, and uh, it's it can be outdoor pole mounted if you don't uh, need a larger NEMA-type enclosure. Uh, our enclosure is weatherproof, and we make a VHF and a UHF version of these radios. In white space, there are uh, seven VHF channels and 37 UHF, and uh, so we make both versions. I think we're going to be about uh, the last dog hung on VHF radio. So if you have a special application or a special transmission area, specially challenged, where VHF will give you a little bit more range and more effectiveness, uh, you can work with us and that requirement as well as your UHF requirements. We also uh, have designed and uh, manufactured log periodic antennas for uh, both of those flavors. As uh, Peter mentioned earlier, uh, you know, uh, for this uh, particular sector, you know, we're, we're uh, FCC Part 15 Subpart H compliant. That's pending. Uh, the radios are available today and coming off the manufacturing line, and we do hope to be certified by, uh, by Christmas, so uh, literally any day now. Um, the AWR is a power over Ethernet device, and it is managed by the uh, Spectrum Bridge TV white space database. And, you know, again, um, we have uh, user configurable, uh, configurable data rates, uh, channel bandwidth uh, selections and, and operating frequency. So it's a very flexible radio and meets an awful lot of requirements. The vertical solutions that we have been working in and uh, kind of shaping the development of our products, of course, uh, of interest to WISPA is, uh, and WISPA members, you know, the white space uh, broadband applications. Uh, but also mission-critical industrial telemetry applications, uh, applications where we're understanding more and more now how, uh, how and why SCADA implementers need a migration path when they need an expanded data um, uh, payload. So there is, uh, if you're doing any business in that particular area, uh, you probably know that your SCADA uh, implementers are, are looking for a migration path. Generally speaking, for these radios, uh, you know, challenge terrain requirements are what we really have designed the radio to. And for anyone who knows the art and science of radio, you know, there is always a trade-off and a compromise between uh, throughput and uh, and range and permeability in some tough terrain. So, uh, I think our value is that we've had a lot of empirical data and a lot of testing to kind of tell us where to where to try to design the sweet spot. Uh, dense, consistent coverage and always-on application requirements are what are driving the development of our radio, uh, at least here in you know, the first and second generations. We have endeavored to provide a uh, really stable and strong connection so that application uh, integrity is maintained and uh, so that, you know, our customers are satisfied even in their most mission-critical application. 
what we have endeavored to do on this slide is just to kind of show you the areas that we feel we touch within the really, really diverse white space application uh, spaces. We do uh, consider our radio uh, a very effective tool for those of you who are uh, developing rural broadband uh, implementation plans. And you know, we understand that uh, you know, when you look at our throughputs, uh, you may have to architect uh, in special ways, in, in some manners, to, to meet your, uh, your uh, monetization scheme you know, with your number of subscribers, what the terrain looks like, how, how far it is dispersed and stuff, but we will work with you on uh, path studies and, and help you do a real professional response out to your subscriber base and to come up with a really good uh, business plan. But please also understand that the effectiveness of our radios helps in the industrial telemetry sector or the sectors that are really you know exponentially expanding like machine to machine. Um, we have uh, done a lot of testing and a lot of tuning of our radio products to deliver in those sectors when a client or an implementer needs absolute constant connectivity. We're really in the second or third generation of, the, of those uh, uh, kinds of tests in the sense that we understand now what happens to a client when their application keeps dying out in the field. So, you know, we have as I said, our, our uh, philosophy has been to understand that increasing reliability sometimes means throttling the data rate and, you know, coming up with a sweet spot compromise for that particular solution. You know, once again, our uh, Agility White Space Radio is really for increasingly mission critical applications and applications which need always on uh, connection integrity. Um, Larry, do you have anything? Uh, so that, you know, we're, it's kind of brief, but uh, for those of you who uh, would like to uh, visit our website, uh, ktswireless.com, uh, to look over our products, look over our vertical sectors, and to call us and talk to us about supporting your uh, responses to customers, your proposals, path studies, et cetera. We're very happy to work with you, very privileged uh, to work with uh, Spectrum Bridge. And we'd like to really welcome Carlson Wireless in this space because, oddly enough, we, we are working together to validate a market segment and to expand that market. So uh, our friendly competitors are actually our coopetition at Carlson Wireless that we really want to welcome also. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Andy. Okay, next we have Jim Carlson and uh, Kylie Cronin from Carlson Wireless. Um, they will present their products, and uh, Jim spent the last uh, 25 years realizing his vision of fixed wireless telecommunications um, in the rural and uh, remote uh, areas across the globe. So, uh, Jim, are you there? Yes, hi. Thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, Long and Peter, and thank you for the kind words there, uh, Andy. Um, uh, basically, uh, on that, that first page, I was uh, showing the uh, the two uh, the two women from uh, back in the fifties uh, and sixties. Uh, that was Lucy. I Lucy. Yeah, I love Lucy show holding up that antenna. I have to acknowledge that uh, Jack Unger uh, helped me get that from Whisper Group uh, in. Um, so we'll talk about the product uh, design evolution here. And, and, and from our experiences in looking into the market, we noticed that there was some critical uh, things that the WISP, for instance, initially needed. And that was um, they needed non-line-of-sight coverage. Uh, and that's a very challenging uh, uh, multipath environment. They needed adequate bandwidth for the, uh, the last mile customers. And they needed to have the cost you know, justifiable to their they're uh, comparable to, to, to DSL and other competition that they might have in cable. Yeah, um, just to jump in. You know, basically everyone we talk to brings up Netflix and increased throughput requirements. And so um, the ability to maximize throughput where we could um, at the distances that were feasible for it was of, of an utmost requirement for um, not only current usage but future usage. 
So we began a uh, hardware solution um, probably about uh, five months ago or so uh, that focused on um, a coverage uh, more than range. And so it, uh, it, it focused on with uh, the full band of the UHF, including international um, channels. It's also uh, designed with a, uh, in the 16 qualm section, it runs at, uh, at 16 megabits over the air rate. Um, and it also supports uh, QPSK as well. Uh, and uh, this, this can deliver, you know, 10 plus megabits to, to users, depending on the sharing load. Uh, and our focus on cost was to be under $600 initially in the first run per CPE, moving to $400 in 2013 per unit. Um, another thing that we helped to reduce the pricing on this is by we moved to a 75 ohm F-type connector uh, and cableization with the antennas so that uh, it allows for uh, lower, lower cost antenna structures. Um, we also partnered with Newell on the software side. Uh, their uh, their ASIC chip um, designer folks there that are working on an ASIC, and uh, they're uh, loaning us their, the software for the product to uh, to prove that out. And so we initially tested that software in a very extreme locations where we had uh, terrible uh, fading uh, multipath problems, and, uh, and found it to, to be uh, successful. Next slide. So the, um, the, on the technical side, it was to meet the regulatory, the bandwidth, the cost without an ASIC. Um, and so we, we set the criteria, the, the power being uh, maximum legal at the antenna of uh, plus 36, and the spectral emissions uh, you know, requirement at the plus 3 and plus 9 megahertz from center. Uh, second, third, harmonics uh, at the lowest operating frequency is, is very tough involved because it operates into the 900 megahertz band. Uh, and then the power spell spectral density rule, you know, is another uh, piece of the equation. And last, but the uh, EA cost and efficiencies um, were, were also challenging. So um, to do all this with power over Ethernet in an outdoor enclosure, you know, it was our goals. And we're able to achieve this, you know, uh, probably about uh, Two and a half months ago, we, we were then able to design for production. Next slide. So a lot of this has already been discussed, but um, you know, basically the number of devices out there that could or are needing to be connected um, definitely outnumbers the amount of people. Um, smart grid is a pretty uh, well-recognized term. Smart houses, smart cities, smart cars. Um, smart anything. That's kind of the evolution of product design. Uh, also in regards to industrial applications um, for SCADA and telemetry, video surveillance is kind of the, the, uh, the direction that every operator wants to go. It helps with on-the-spot maintenance, uh, evaluation. Um, it, it helps in regards to security and having something you can actually prosecute with. Um, and so it is considered kind of the component um, necessary in regards to um, upgrade and, and future considerations. And so high throughput was a was a um, was a primary primary requirement of that. Uh, in regards to the enterprise sector, telemedicine, distance learning is definitely something which is uh, I think going to be of a, a value in regards to using TV white space. Um, <clears throat> telemedicine, there's obviously going to be a lot of uh, people who are off of a high throughput grid and require connectivity in a life mission critical um, type scenario. Distance learning, that is also going to um, allow uni universities to more easily connect students uh, and is also going to be utilized on campuses as well as an alternative to uh, uh, cost of lease lines or, or just ineffective uh, 2.4 solutions. Public safety, um, TV white space definitely offers the potential for a necessary redundant network. Um, you know, disasters occur and often the, uh, the uh, increased communication from the public bogs down public safety networks. 
So a redundant uh, TV white space system that is a wide area, non-line site will will advantage that. And then of course there's um, a lot of backhaul applications as well, electrical substations, uh, along lines of SCADA as well, really. But uh, that'll increase the the reach of wireless communications into more remote areas. Next slide. And so the time frame um, of the Rural Connect 2, uh, basically running of production quantities now to allow us to meet a market price. Um, 1,000 units are in the production cycle. First products to roll off the line in uh, January 2012. We are hoping that uh, the FCC and IC certification will occur in uh, February 2012 and that the second run is now in the planning stages. Uh, we were able to kick this off because of the, uh, the WISPA group there at uh, WISPA Palooza in Las Vegas on October uh, 12th had a uh, show that we announced that we'd like to, uh, to, to do this and we did have uh, enough people sign up to pre-order the 1,000 units uh, which helps make this you know sort of a, uh, a, a reasonable business uh, plan here. So we're then, you know, down in the section of uh, ASIC solution early 2013. 